It's five o'clock in the morning in Bratislava, Slovakia. These men are professional drivers, but their truck is hundreds of miles away from there in Belgium. That truck will not just be their workspace, it will be their home for months on end. The model that the road transport sector is following more and more is uh, companies from the West opening uh, fictive subsidiaries in countries with low income. They recruit drivers, they bring the drivers to work on permanent basis in the country of, so to say, origin of the business. And this is how they use the advantages offered by the internal market. The salary of these drivers amounts to 700 euros gross per month. It's more than what they could ever dream of in their home country, but it's only about a third of what some of their colleagues from Western Europe earn for the same work. Many drivers of the new member states, they feel that they are discriminated on basis of nationality. At the same time in Belgium, a transport workers' union is waging an awareness campaign against what they see as unfair competition from Eastern European drivers. It's important that these people are getting paid what they deserve to be paid. Uh, they're pushing out, out of the market. The only way to stop that is to make sure that they get the same wages as we do, so we can keep working and they can keep working on a decent wage. Drivers from the East who feel discriminated, drivers from the West who feel threatened. We hit the road to find out what exactly is going on in European road transport. Mi chiamo Sergio Angruic, eh, Sergio. Sono un autista di linea internazionale, eh, sono sposato, ho quattro figli, ho 43 anni, sono nato nel Montenegro, poi all'arrivo della guerra decido di, di venire in Italia. Il lavoro sul camion è un lavoro che pochi conoscono, è un lavoro molto, molto solitare, si vive molta solitudine, è facile proprio non è, si sta fuori per una settimana, il weekend se tutto va bene si rientra a casa, è un lavoro che porta molti sacrifici, affetti, vicinanza alla famiglia, ti dimentichi le date, compleanni, feste, non ci sei mai, non vivi quelle emozioni familiari che sono molto importanti. Sergio is one of the three million truck drivers roaming the roads of Europe, a life made of lonely parking lots gas stations, truck stops, and endless highways. A routine far different from the adventurous image of the trucking lifestyle. Viaggiare, dicevo, è molto bello. Quando lo dici agli altri, pensano che hai tempo, magari, di vedere le bellezze di un paese o magari quando gli dici che sei stato a Parigi immaginano che sei andato già magari a vedere la Tour dei Eiffel. Eh, io ci lavoro da dieci passanni e non l'ho ancora vista. La mia più grande preoccupazione è il lavoro, eh, il trasporto. 
hanno consentito un'apertura delle frontiere senza monitorare un settore come il trasporto. Cioè, eh, noi eh, in Europa abbiamo le diverse realtà che possono variare da 280 euro di uno stipendio eh, fisso di un autista bulgaro a 330 di quello rumeno, eh, 1.800 quasi 2.000 euro di quello lussemburghese, 1.500 quello italiano. E, insomma, non si può lavorare in queste condizioni. The road transport is a service. So um, the, European, the, the road transport operators were more and more interested to offer a cheap service and labor costs, of course, account for the largest uh, percentage within the cost of transport, so to say. So the interest was always to keep the labor cost down or to get it um, down. And with the access to, so to say, a lower wage level Uh, member states uh, access to their workforce, this was possible. This is social dumping. Social dumping, or the use of weaker labor and social standards to be more competitive, has become widespread in European road transport, and truck drivers are the ones bearing the consequences. It is commonly assumed that it all started with the enlargement of the European Union to Central and Eastern European countries in 2004. That, however, is not entirely true. Fears of social dumping, along with accusations of foreigners stealing jobs, already began in the 1980s when Greece, followed by Spain and Portugal, joined the European Economic Community. At the same time, international road transport was progressively liberalized. By the end of the 1990s, it was completely deregulated and open to competition across Europe. Since then, The issue of social dumping has been a headache for European institutions and has widened the divide between Eastern and Western Europe. In the European Parliament, MEPs often clash over the best way to protect workers. Mais tout le monde sait que le dumping social, ce n'est rien d'autre que l'exploitation des salariés par certaines entreprises aux pratiques injustes. Et c'est l'un des enjeux, je vous le dis, c'est l'un des enjeux qui mine le projet européen dans son ensemble. Si nous sommes incapables, durant cette mandature, de régler la question du dumping social, c'est la fin du projet européen. The freedom of movement of services and workers, however, has enabled the low-wage countries to build up their economies. And as a result, also the salaries in these countries have risen, very naturally. So we should continue to make the most of the opportunities that the single market has to offer, and not start sailing towards unknown direction with unknown results. I like to drive. <laughs> I like to drive. I like to drive big trucks. And I like to travel. I work for two months or three months. And after that, I go home for, uh, for one month. I meet few of my colleagues, few. We cook together, we eat together, we drink one beer, maybe two, who knows, <laughs> if we have. And after that, I'm going to my cabin. Depends which weather it's outside. I try to spend some time till I'm going to sleep. I am a family man. Yeah? And uh, I miss everything from, from home, from my home. Yeah, I miss my wife, I miss my children, my child, actually. I miss everything. I don't know, sometimes when I smell, smell like home, but when I look on the window, it's not my home. Yeah, it's very hard, it's very hard to be away from your family. But I have money to have a decent uh, life. So what if I am from Eastern Europe? If I remember correctly, in 1940, uh, two guys, Ribbentrop and Molotov, cut the Europe in two. Uh, they 
write on the paper, Eastern Europe, Western Europe. Before that, Eastern Europe don't exist. Uh, it was one Europe. Because that two stupid people, yeah, how I told you, Ribbentrop, Ribbentrop and Molotov, yeah, they signed and cut the Europe in two. And look, 70 years ago, we still suffering about that. de toute discrimination. Nous sommes pour faire en sorte que tous les travailleurs du transport puissent travailler dans toute l'Europe, mais en respectant les mêmes droits. Et qu'il n'y ait pas ce qu'on appelle aujourd'hui, et ce n'est pas un vain mot, de l'esclavage moderne. Aujourd'hui, vous avez des dizaines de milliers de chauffeurs qui vivent trois mois, six mois en dehors de chez eux pour un salaire de misère. Et ces salaires de misère sont organisés en grande partie par des employeurs qui ne sont pas des employeurs d'Europe de l'Est, mais des employeurs d'ici, des employeurs de chez nous, des employeurs de Belgique, de France, d'Allemagne, des Pays-Bas. Ce sont ceux-là les exploiteurs et ce sont ceux-là qu'on doit combattre. In the last 15 years, transporters from the West increasingly moved east in search of cheaper labor. Bratislava is one of the most popular hubs for employers who can register a business via specialized agencies for only 29 euros a month, discretion guaranteed. These agencies are reluctant to speak on camera. They have a, a, a base with the trucks somewhere here? Oh, uh, no, no. Uh, Slovak uh, law, for, for, for Slovak uh, database of companies, each company needs a seat, registered uh -huh. seat, and I own this building and I give uh, all of these uh, companies uh, paper. It's only only virtual seat here, yeah? So it's he like a letterbox company? Yeah. Uh, okay. No, he has a um, letterbox, yeah, yeah. Non stiamo parlando più di un mercato, qua stiamo parlando di evasione fiscale, eh, stiamo parlando di, di un inganno, stiamo parlando di un imbroglio. Io personalmente eh, provo un profondo disgusto a, a questo tipo di imprenditori che usano questo tipo di manodopera che ci vive sul camion per mesi. Sono condizioni disumane. Eerst een dodelijke brand in een loods in Wingenen. Twee Poolse chauffeurs blijven in de vlammen, vier anderen zijn gewond. Officieel verbleef er maar één persoon in die loods, maar in werkelijkheid logeerden er elf Poolse chauffeurs die rijden voor een transportbedrijf in de buurt. Rond drie uur vannacht schieten de Poolse truckers wakker. De loods waarin ze slapen staat in brand. De vlammen slaan al door het dak als de brandweer van Wingenen arriveert. Negen Polen die er wonen raken op tijd naar buiten, maar al snel is duidelijk dat er nog mensen binnen zitten. In deze zaak zijn we van oordeel dat er inderdaad mensenhandel, sporen van mensenhandel aanwezig zijn. Meer algemeen in de transportsector zijn we van oordeel als mensen moeten kamperen, als zij maandenlang van huis zijn, als zij niet goed betaald worden, ja, dan zijn er voldoende elementen om, om te spreken over mensenhandel. Als men moet slapen in een loods, eh, dan zijn er volgens ons elementen van mensenhandel. Dus Meer algemeen um, vinden wij dat de menselijke waardigheid in het gedrang komt. En dit leidt tot het misdrijf mensenhandel. Pavel, one of the two Poles who died in the fire, is buried here in eastern Poland. He had just turned 27 and was about to get married. Eight years later, Pavel's mother Wanda is still longing for answers. No one has yet been held accountable for this tragedy. Pawła, jako młodego, sympatycznego chłopaka, wesołego, bardzo pomocnego, takiego, który nie potrafił komuś odmówić. Jeżeli go ktoś o coś poprosił, Pawełek nie odmówił. 
nigdy po sobie nie pokazywał, że nie jest zadowolony. Nigdy tego po sobie nie pokazał, więc ja nie wiedziałam, co tam się dzieje. Dowiedziałam się dopiero, jak pojechałam już po, po ciało mojego dziecka. Zobaczyłam, jakie są tam warunki, jak wyglądał budynek. W Polsce jest duże bezrobocie, są niskie płace. I Polacy, młodzi ludzie szukają czegoś lepszego, lepszego startu w życiu. Jeżeli w Polsce szuka pracy prawda, i nie może jej znaleźć lub pracuje za tysiąc ileś złotych, to jak on ma później założyć rodzinę, utrzymać tę rodzinę? To tam zarabia więcej, zaciska zęby i pracuje. Are transport companies the only ones to blame for the exploitation of workers? What about the manufacturers, the retailers, and the logistic companies who commission transport services? Should they be more diligent to ensure that all their subcontractors offer decent working conditions and fair wages? EU law and jurisprudence stipulate that the labor standards that should apply to a driver are the ones of the country where he or she carries out most of the work. But how can this be applied effectively when millions of trucks crisscross a continent with open borders, when enforcement is left at the hands of national governments, and when a growing number of truckers are recruited from outside the European Union. Okay. Thank you very much. I am Michael Jordan, Filipino truckers from Europe. Filipino drivers on European roads, the ultimate extent to which companies are willing to stretch to reduce labor costs at the expense of human well-being. These men spend one year in their truck, hundreds of days in a row working, eating and sleeping in their four square meter cabin. That is my house. Bedroom. With double deck room. The company that employs these workers was created in Latvia by a Swedish national who recruited drivers in the Philippines to make them drive almost exclusively in Western Europe. Why Latvia? Perhaps because it has the second lowest minimum wage in the European Union. I spent 12 months on the road. And after 12 months, uh, I take my vacation to the Philippines. After, after 45 days, I just came back to sign another contract. It's 670 euros per month, but we have uh, 20 euros per day for, for meal allowance. Do you think it's a good salary for what you're doing? Yes, for me, it's good salary for me because it's it's a big money for, for the Philippines, for my family. It's, it's a big money, it's big help for my family. Many Filipino drivers tell the same story. Despite their difficult working conditions, few of them say they feel exploited. Many, like Jimele, previously worked in Saudi Arabia under worse conditions. For them, Europe is a unique opportunity to provide a better life for their families. This is my life, and I love my work. Do you miss your country? Do you miss your family? Yes, I miss my country, of course. I miss my wife and my son. But I have no other choice because I don't have a work in the Philippines. That's why I am uh, here. It's better to work here than rather starve to death in the Philippines. <laughs> Faced with mounting criticism of the rules guiding road transport, the European Commission reacted in 2017 with the so-called mobility package. There is no place for social dumping in European Union. In this context, the mobility package will provide truly European solution, which combine the necessary protection of workers 
and at the same time aim at preventing the fragmentation of internal market. The mobility package reforms a number of rules aimed at fighting against letterbox companies, extending a country's labor rights to all drivers operating on its territory, and regulating the number of deliveries a truck is allowed to perform in a foreign member state. The EU's initial goal was to remove restrictions on transport services while also aiming for the application of equal pay for equal work in the same place. This would ultimately set the stage for a years-long contentious political battle with divisions often marked along national rather than party lines. Redacted documents from EU institutions show how some interest groups tried to weigh in the debate. Business associations argue that the measures are discriminatory against Eastern Europe, push for additional flexibility in the sector, oppose an EU-wide enforcement agency, and label the reforms as a threat to entrepreneurial freedom. Member states also voiced their opinion. While some in the East say the measures are a blow to their economies and to the single market, others in the West claim it is a right step towards fair competition. This is the problem within the European Union in general, yeah? not, not only on, on the transport level, but you have to see it from both perspectives, you know. As I have spoken at that time uh, with, the, with the Bulgarian uh, minister, he told me, look, if you do your legislation how, as you wish, this will increase the voices of your populace in my member state. Then I responded to him, if I don't do that, it will increase the voices of the populace in my member states. Truck drivers from Eastern European countries have protested against a new EU mobility package. Transport workers of Europe are divided. Eastern European drivers believe that the application of higher social standards will threaten their access to the transport market. Western European drivers, on the other hand, think that opening the market further will equally phase them out of work. In the end, it's all about jobs. What some see as protectionism is seen by others as social rights. One person's competitive advantage is another person's unfair competition. The freedom to, to work wherever you wish, of course we want to see that continue, but not at any cost. And whilst the standard of living may be cheaper in the East, that doesn't mean that those drivers who work in the West for Western countries and Western companies should be exploited. If you're working in Western Europe for a Western company, you should be paid Western European wages. We would all love German wages. We don't have them. Don't kill the countries that support Europe the most with this horrible, horrible directive. Drivers are not second-class workers in this union. They deserve exactly the same rights when it comes to posting like all other workers in the EU. This is not a time to put at risk the internal market and therefore growth and jobs. And many of the amendments are doing exactly that. Votre démarche est politiquement dangereuse car la réponse des peuples à la jungle sociale c'est la colère. Despite years of discussions, the mobility package has yet to be formally adopted by the European Union. While some claim it punishes transporters from Eastern Europe, others believe it will improve the working conditions of drivers. Some of them can't wait any longer. Two years after sharing his love for the job, Jamela resigned from his company after an argument with his boss over working conditions. He uh, told us, if you don't not happy anymore, we have a Ukrainian and you have a Georgian to replace you. And that's, that's not good, yeah, that's bullshit. I work hard, I, I spend my time in my truck. I gambled my health here, working here in company. And, and, and that's all I'm gonna hear from them. And that's bullshit. Jamela now lives in Canada, where he works as a truck driver. Non credo eh, e non condivido l'idea che eh, gli autisti dell'est sono i colpevoli di questa situazione. È colpevole la forma, è colpevole la politica che ha legiferato queste condizioni. 
Sergio continues to deliver cargo across Europe. He still hasn't seen the Eiffel Tower. I can say that I am proud to be European because I am not European. I am European at, at my home, but here I am not European or I am second-hand European. And it's not so fair. Viorel is still a truck driver and remains for months at a time on the road. As Europe struggles to respond to the issues splitting the bloc between East and West, truck drivers continue to endure the sacrifices that keep this economy running. Who benefits from this situation and how far it will go are questions that are yet to be answered.